It doesn't make sense for the US to be present in the Middle East, but why are they still there? In today's video, we're going to talk about the petrodollar and how it's key to the dollar's hegemony. Let me give you a heads up about something. The Iraq war wasn't about weapons of mass destruction, and the fall of Muammar Gaddafi wasn't because he was a bad man and the United States was worried about the people of Libya. But before we start, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like. Our channel is new, and this helps the content reach more people. If you enjoy the video, consider becoming a channel member. Your financial contribution helps us keep going. We don't get paid for making videos yet. At the beginning of 2020, there was a major conflict between the United States and Iran that almost led to open war. Iran blew up several oil tankers in the Persian Gulf throughout 2019. In early 2020, the United States killed Qasem Soleimani, a top Iranian general. Iran retaliated by firing rockets at American bases in Iraq. But eventually, things calmed down. Especially after Trump promised to withdraw troops from the Middle East as soon as possible. The United States entered the Middle East in the early 2000s to retaliate for the attacks on the Twin Towers by Arab terrorists and to destroy Al-Qaeda, which they believed was responsible for the attack. While they were there, they also invaded Iraq because of the supposed plans for weapons of mass destruction. But deep down, everyone knew there was also the issue of oil. At that time, the United States had a huge oil deficit and needed oil from the region to keep running. It was important for them to maintain control there because a conflict in that region would directly affect them. This wasn't the excuse they used for the invasions, but it was certainly a factor. Since then, they never really left. However, in the meantime, the Americans discovered fracking, a technique for extracting oil from porous rocks with vast deposits within U.S. territory. Since then, their production has increased dramatically, and today the United States is self-sufficient in oil. They don't need to buy oil from anyone. Now that they no longer depend on oil from the region, the United States would love to leave the Middle East. Staying there has a huge cost and brings no benefit. This actually could have been done a long time ago. So why do the United States insist on maintaining a presence in the region, apparently against their own interests? To understand this, it's worth taking a deeper look at this story. The Iranian regime and the Saudi Arabian regime have been long-time enemies, both competing for control of the Persian Gulf region. Part of the conflict arises from religious differences between Shia and Sunni Muslim groups. We've covered this extensively in other videos. But a large part of the conflict also comes from more trivial desires to establish regional dominance. However, beyond these facts, for more than 40 years, Saudi Arabia has held an important card in its conflict with Iran, continued American support for the Saudi regime. But why do the Americans seem so willing to maintain this strange and even unjustified support for such a unique entity in the Middle East? These close ties certainly can't be due to any American support for democracy or human rights. The Saudi regime is one of the most intolerant and anti-democratic in the world. Its ruling class has repeatedly been connected to Islamic terrorist groups, with Foreign Policy magazine in 2021 declaring Saudi Arabia as the beating heart of the absolutist religious creed that helped to sow ideas like those of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It also has nothing to do with American dependence on oil imports from the region, which was significant at one point, but has ceased to be relevant since the development of fracking. The answer lies in the fact that Saudi Arabia is at the center of the United States' efforts to maintain the dollar as the world's reserve currency and ensure global demand for its debt. The origins of this system date back decades. In 1974, the US dollar was in a precarious position. By 1931, due to excessive spending on wars and welfare, the United States could no longer maintain the global gold price in line with the Bretton Woods system established in 1944. The value of the dollar relative to gold fell as the supply of dollars increased, a byproduct of growing deficit spending. Governments and foreign investors began to lose faith in the dollar, and both Switzerland and France demanded gold in exchange for dollars, as stipulated by Bretton Woods. In response to these and other events, President Richard Nixon announced that the United States would abandon the Bretton Woods system ending the parity between the dollar and gold. The dollar began to float against other currencies. It's no surprise that the devaluation of the dollar didn't restore confidence in IT. Besides, the United States made no effort to curb deficit spending, 
so they needed to find ways to sell government debt without raising interest rates. In other words, the U.S. needed more buyers for its debt. The motivation to address this increased even further after 1973, with the first oil price shock, which worsened the inflation caused by the deficit the Americans were facing. In 1974, the massive influx of dollars into the world's largest oil exporter, Saudi Arabia, suggested a solution. That year, Nixon sent the new U.S. Treasury Secretary, William Simon, to Saudi Arabia with a mission. According to Andrea Wong from Bloomberg, the objective was to neutralize crude oil as an economic weapon against the United States and find a way to persuade hostile Saudi Arabia to finance the U.S.'s growing deficit with its new wealth in petrodollars. The basic structure was surprisingly simple. The United States would buy oil from Saudi Arabia and provide military aid and equipment to Saudi Arabia. In return, the Saudis would invest billions of their petrodollar revenue into U.S. Treasury bonds, thus financing American spending. From the perspective of U.S. public finances, this seemed like a win-win situation. The Saudis would receive protection against geopolitical enemies, and the United States would have a new place to unload large amounts of government debt. Additionally, the Saudis could keep their dollars in relatively safe and reliable investments in the United States. This became known as petrodollar recycling. By spending on oil, the United States and other oil importing countries, which were required to use dollars, were creating new demand for American debt and American dollars. Since Saudi Arabia dominated the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, OPEC, the dollar deal was extended to OPEC in general meaning that the dollar became the preferred currency for oil purchases worldwide. This scheme secured the dollar's place as a currency of immense global importance. This was especially crucial during the 1970s and early 1980s. After all, until the early 1980s, OPEC enjoyed a 50% share of the world's oil market. Today, Saudi Arabia is behind Russia and the United States itself in terms of oil production. As of 2019, OPEC's share of the global market remains around 30%, which has reduced the role of the petrodollar compared to the heady days of the 1970s, but its overall importance certainly hasn't been destroyed. We can see the continued significance of the petrodollar in U.S. foreign policy, which continues to antagonize and threaten any major oil exporting country that tries to end its dependence on the dollar. As noted by Matt Hatfield in the Harvard Political Review, it's no coincidence that especially bellicose American foreign policy has been applied to the Iraqi, Libyan, and Iranian regimes. Hatfield writes that in 2000, Saddam Hussein, then president of Iraq, announced that Iraq was moving to sell its oil in euros instead of dollars. After the September 11, 2001 attacks, the United States invaded Iraq, deposed Saddam Hussein and reverted Iraq's oil sales back to the US dollar. This exact pattern was repeated with Muammar Gaddafi when he tried to create a unified African currency backed by Libya's gold reserves to also sell African oil. Shortly after he announced this, rebels armed by the government and allied with the United States overthrew the dictator and his regime. After his death, the idea of African oil being sold in anything other than the dollar quickly disappeared. Other regimes that called for abandoning the petrodollar include Iran and Venezuela. Currently, the United States is calling for regime change in these two countries. This is not to absolve the United States adversaries of any crimes for which they are known. In fact, all these regimes are criminal. It is about challenging the supposed American interest in intervening militarily in countries that cause economic discomfort, while other countries just as criminal, or perhaps even more so, remain free, even to the extent of dismembering journalists in their embassies. In 2021, Saudi Arabia threatened to sell its oil in currencies other than the dollar if the U.S. government passed a law exposing OPEC members to U.S. antitrust action. This shows that the Saudi regime knows it has at least some leverage with the United States because of Saudi Arabia's central role in the petrodollar system. Saudi Arabia is one of the few countries that can bluff against the United States on matters like this. As has become quite clear from U.S. policy in recent decades, the United States is more than willing to invade foreign countries that undermine its petrodollar system. However, in the case of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia's position as an antagonist to Iran, and as the third largest oil exporter in the world, means that the United States will likely avoid unnecessary conflicts. Additionally, it's likely that Saudi investments in American stocks, bonds, and other assets are significant. So when the Saudis make threats, this implicitly includes the value of Saudi holdings in the United States. According to reports, 
Saudi Arabia also warned that it might start selling up to $750 billion in U.S. Treasury securities and other assets if the U.S. Congress passes a law allowing Saudi Arabia to be held liable in U.S. courts for the 2001 terrorist attacks. Of course, the U.S. should be working to become less dependent on its foreign creditors. This should be especially true for Saudi-owned debt and other assets held by OPEC, given the declining global role of OPEC and Saudi Arabia in terms of market share. Instead, the United States has been accumulating increasingly large amounts of debt in recent years. In 1919, for example, the annual deficit exceeded $1 trillion. In past times, the United States didn't spend this much. This kind of debt accumulation would have been reserved only for wartime and periods of economic depression. However, this enormous growth in debt has made the U.S. government more sensitive to changes in demand for American debt, and it has made the American government increasingly dependent on external demand for U.S. debt and dollars. This means that to avoid a crisis, the United States needs to ensure that interest rates remain low and that foreigners continue to want to buy American dollars in debt. The grim diagnosis is that the United States has become a hostage to Saudi Arabia, thanks to the old evil known as Keynesianism. This whole ideological push for increased spending, which seems so appealing during times of crisis, creates the well-known problem of economic cycles. Knowing that, at some point, the market will have to retreat and adjust to the real situation of supply and demand, and that this won't happen without tears along the way. The leaders of the time do everything they can to delay the necessary adjustments while hoping for a miracle or for the end of their term as president. Kicking the problem down the road to the next president is always an option. If petrodollars and petrodollar recycling were to disappear, it would have a double effect on U.S. government finances. A considerable decline in petrodollar recycling would force a significant increase in interest rates. The result would be a budgetary crisis for the U.S. government, requiring it to allocate increasingly large amounts of the federal budget to debt service. The other option would be for the U.S. central bank to monetize the debt by purchasing increasingly large amounts of U.S. debt to make up for the lack of external demand. This would lead to an increase in price inflation. Moreover, if participants started exiting the petrodollar system and began selling oil in euros, the demand for dollars would fall worsening the scenario in which the central bank is monetizing the debt. This would also generally contribute to higher price inflation since fewer dollars are being absorbed outside the United States by foreigners buying U.S. debt. The result of this could be a continued decline in U.S. government spending and services and an increase in price inflation. The U.S. government's ability to finance its debt would decrease significantly, forcing the United States to cut back on military commitments, pensions, and much more. Otherwise, the government would have to continue spending at the same rate and face an inflationary spiral. In the end, this Keynesian arrangement of printing money to re-elect American politicians turns out to be quite similar to cases of severe drug addiction. The patient, already dependent and out of control, needs increasingly massive doses of the toxic substance, remaining hostage to it, unable to live without it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave a like. Consider becoming a member and supporting our project. See you next time.